all be in here. And we'll go ahead and call this to order, and we will start our evening with a moment of reflection. All right, fantastic. If you uh, please rise and uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. on to our school report. Before we get there, I want to let parents know that if uh, your um, child is getting recognized or a member of your family is getting recognized, you can stand right in front of me, take all the photos you want, take the video, this is a good spot to catch everybody, okay? <coughs> so all about you guys tonight, not about us, so make sure you make that happen. And with that, I'd like to invite up uh, Principal Lucy Del Rio and her team. We have visitors as well. Fantastic. And Lucy, before we get going, I just want to say uh, good evening and welcome to your, I'm looking forward to your presentations tonight. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Delrio, before you get going, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I, I need to really quickly because we uh, we had just a little something we wanted to share with you, so we could. Uh, <laughs> we wanted to say big congratulations to you. Uh, Honorees of the Year, 
So I'd like to start with our um, uh, Mrs. Milk Stroll, if you can come up to the podium. Markham, 
um, has been lucky to have had her for the past seven years, and we have no doubt that she will continue to grow in her academic and bilingualism. Betty Gigadas Emery.
and engaging learning environment that values multiculturalism and diversity. Because we're Markham and we're an achiever who can do more, we wanted to do a value statement. And I'm going to have to ask somebody to read that one. Does anybody <laughs> my glasses? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. We value working in close partnership with families and community members to provide a safe, respectful, responsible, and equitable environment that nurtures the growth of our diverse children into compassionate, lifelong learners. Maybe we'll play some on that later. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, with the focus on our students, here's a brief overview of the students and scholars that we serve. I recognize uh, that I have shared a lot of acronyms, and we're going to hear a lot of acronyms, and I'll explain those in the next few slides. So as you can see, these are statistics from last year, but we're, of, of course, uh, eight, eight, uh, nearly 900 students, um, a compilation of English learners, um, English-only students, foster youth, homeless students with IEPs. We have the same variety. Uh, most schools, just more of them. Um, so the first program that you'll be hearing is our um, Spanish English Peer Immersion in Cultural Education, also known as our SPICE program. And uh, it's the only dual immersion program that is pr proudly serves the USC students and that has done so for over 30 years. Our well-established program is richly resourced and is in high demand every year. We have a district goal of graduating students with more than a diploma, and yes, it starts here with the gift of a second language. Educating our neighborhood uh, Markham community students in English only is our equally stellar REACH program. REACH stands for Raising Educational Achievement for College and Career Bound Students. This is an acronym that came like over 20 years ago, so we are, we are still, we were uh, pioneers in the College and Career Bound. Um, and we truly believe that all of our students can have that choice to do so. Now, in the next couple of slides, I plan out to lay a brief picture of how we're moving our school and our students forward cohesively. We've learned a little bit about our students, and next, Ms. Babalun will share a bit about our positive behavior intervention and support system. Support system. There's another acronym. Okay, so it's all the acronyms. <laughs> so it's okay to share a little bit um, of our PBA, from our PBAs. Um, the last two years, we've been working on um, Tier 1 structuring and um, just refining some of those systems that were already at Markham. Um, we have been working hard to uh, align those with our expectations, our school expectations, um, and our three school goals, which are being safe, being respectful, and being responsible. Through the pictures, you can appreciate a couple of, uh, two of these systems. Um, some of these benefits come to our students from all of that hard work that our team is putting together. So we do have our paw shop, which is something where they earn tickets. They can use those tickets to then queue up to our shop to purchase items from our shop. Um, and they do get that input as to what they like and what we want to have in our shop. <coughs> the other one you will notice on there is our wolf den, and that's something that we started this year as well. Or sorry, we started putting it together last year and actually opened it up this year. Uh, definitely with, we, you know, we're talking about that it takes a village. Um, our volunteers are amazing. Um, they are just side by side with our staff, being able to help to follow our initiatives and support those initiatives for our students. So the Wolf Den is another one. We do have uh, gaming systems in there and a couple of other goodies, um, other things that they really enjoyed. That we had the students actually pick out what were some of those items that they would like to have in that room so they can access by purchasing their way in. Or uh, we have something called a good news referral, something similar to a bad news uh, or a negative referral, but it's a positive one. They can use those tickets to enter our Wolf Den. <coughs> one of the things that our team worked uh, diligently on um, and was able to be recognized. You'll see one of our uh, bronze uh, medals there that was received by our team last year. Our tier two is currently um, undergoing training as well to be able to create some systems, um, some intervention systems for our students that need a little bit more support, similar to our check-in and check-out systems. Um, and then you will see a little bit more to come with that. Um, so now we've set up, we know who our students are, we've set up some positive systems for them, and now we have to look at our data. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this uh, slide because I'd like to be up front um, by stating that this is not nearly what we believe the students of Markham are capable of. Um, 
we know that they can do much more than this. But just as our baseline data, we have just under 27% of our students who never exceeded our state standards in English language arts, and 18% um, met or exceeded the standards for math. Um, again, that simply does not reflect the ability nor the potential of our students, and I 100% believe that we can and we will do better. Um, so now what? Um, we have to get really tight on what we want our students to know. So in the PLC model, the exceptional schools are very clear about what we want students to learn. The foundation for this is for all staff to have a common understanding and framework for how we do things at Markham. Clarity and consistency is key. So we started off with some students, um, you know, eight teachers out of our 50 some teachers being trained in PLCs. This year we have 18 more. My goal is to have 100% of them trained. They all speak in the same language. Um, and um, next you'll hear an acronym that is unique to Markham. It's a combination of GLAD, which is Guided Language Acquisition Design, and AVID, which you are all familiar with. We affectionately call this combination GLABID, and Mr. Nanders is going to share a little about this. Thank you. Yes, so as Ms. Norino was saying, our GLABID team and also our AVID team really puts emphasis on acknowledging that the AVID and GLAD initiatives and programs really just allow us to highlight the great work that already exists within our classroom spaces um, and allowing us to truly highlight what our staff members are already doing in their class in terms of the practices and the strategies that come with both of these. Um, which our GLABID team has been able to provide specific professional development opportunities to our whole staff just to kind of pull everyone in together because when in talking about AVID and some of the wicker strategies, um, we've come to understand that some of our teaching staff are a little bit nervous when it comes to it, but ultimately we really want to emphasize this is work we're already doing in the classrooms. We're just now trying to become a little bit more aligned with it. Um, and so throughout the year, there's been an emphasis on writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. And so as we continue to navigate and grow together, um, one of the things that we would like to highlight is that this uh, summer, we are going to be taking 13 staff members to an AVID training. And so we are super excited about that. And our teaching staff is supporting our students through these practices. And a key piece of ensuring that this works is supporting students through attendance. So attendance, um, we do have a variety of attendance uh, supports in place. Um, so a couple of the things that you'll see on the screen here, um, some of our classrooms are individually tracking their classroom attendance and supporting their students through uh, providing some of those encouragements in class. We do have more of a school-wide system. Um, we do share information out to our parents who our parents who are at. Um, we also have daily calls from our office staff that go out in terms of you know encouraging the students, clarifying what the attendance concerns were. Um, if you take a look at one of the slides here, or one of the pictures up on the top, we have uh, this is something that we share with our families consistently. So we have we are currently at uh, we're sorry. I'll start with last year's. Last year's attendance for us was 92.8%. This year we are at 94.1%. And if you look at that little teal circle there, our goal is 95. So we are excited to be um, getting closer, inching our way towards that goal, um, and hopefully superseding that goal. Um, this is definitely something that we will continue working on. A couple of the things that you see on there are just some of our attendance either encouragement or challenges that we have. So um, we have paletas from La Michoacana, which was something that one of our SRSs helped to collaborate with this, uh, with this store and provide those for our students who had uh, perfect attendance at some point within that challenge period. We also have chocolate milk. All of the kids want chocolate milk, but that's only for our kiddos with perfect attendance. So our um, grade levels, um, so the one with the perfect attendance for that week will receive chocolate milk for a day of that week. Um, we're working our way. They're trying, to, they're trying to buy more days of the week. <laughs> um, attendance ribbons, so we do that through some of our, um, some of our uh, monthly awards assemblies, sorry. Um, we have our brag tags that we have. 
Um, my own two kiddos who attend, Markham as well, um, he loves it. He hears that little chime and I tell him, you, hear, you sound like mom with her kids at work. He loves that little chime with the brass tag. Um, Super Saturdays are another way that we encourage making up some of that attendance. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, our daily calls. Um, this is definitely a combined, a combined effort. You know, we mentioned it earlier and I keep saying it takes a village at Markham, it really does. Um, our office staff making those daily calls, but then the support we receive from our student re-engagement specialists in making the calls and making those home visits and really bringing it all together to improve our attendance. So that 95% that's almost there is really that combined effort, so thank you. Um, okay, so we have, uh, we know what we want to do, we have the resources and materials, we have great teachers training, next is our intervention. So we saw that we had a lot of students who were, were, weren't meeting, meeting state standards. So um, fortunately, uh, what do we do with students who um, haven't learned it? That's another PLC question. Uh, we have a well-established, strong intervention program at Markham. Um, although many of our half of our students receive intervention support, we would like to reduce that number by continuing to focus on first bit instruction. We hope that number shrinks. There will always be students that need support and we're ready to give it to them, but, but we need that number to go down and that starts with first bit instruction. Okay, so what else makes Markham the, the school, right? So we know that we're, we have the largest extended learning opportunity program, the largest ELOP program. We serve right around 130 students with the right at school, school program. We have a wonderful relationship with Jen Victoria. She's our manager there. Um, super respectful and collaborative, but very communicative with us. We're so glad that our students have a good place to go after school. Of course, we're the largest Title I school, so that we receive quite a bit of supplemental funds um, that support our SIPSA, which is our um, school plan for student achievement. We, I'm gonna say that's pretty true. We have the best school in um, the USD. We serve over um, eight, about seven to 800 meals um, served daily, and I just wanna show you that that's a sushi bowl there that has crab and <laughs> well, I need to say that we're the largest elementary school, you probably are going to know that. Um, and we have the most immersive bilinguals uh, and English learners. And with that, I want to say that uh, we also have 28 students that were being reclassified this year. And this, again, is with the collaborative support from the district. We have a wonderful um, English language development coordinator who's also a GLAD trained specialist. So this, this high power, she supports teachers with the curriculum, implementation, <coughs> testing, modeling, coaching. Um, and uh, just really making that welcome connection with our English learners and our, uh, who are moving by bilingual. We're also proud of our community partners. We have, in here in this picture, you'll see our Cox on Campus program. We have uh, officers that uh, work with all five of our fifth grade classes. Um, we even said it's either all classes or no classes. They wanted to do that, so we're glad that they're supporting the whole grade level. You can see here that we have parents who volunteer at school events, also the volunteer in the classroom. We have our Latino literacy group up there that happens two or three times a year. And those ELAC parents really help us do everything else. So they give us input on our goals, they give us input on the food, on, on teachers, everything. So, and PBIS too, those, those, those moms are there all the time. Um, so, and, and you can see that it's a double rainbow there at Markham because we're doubly good, I'm sure you feel that. <laughs> okay, so we're all working hard, we're all exhausted. I don't know if you guys know, we did our color run today, we're exhausted for your day, but we still find time to have fun on campus. You can see here, there's, there's kids riding their bikes, tug of war. I just want you to take a minute to absorb and look at the look of joy in the picture, on the bottom picture, is that those, every one of those faces, I would love to see my child have that look of joy at school. Um, and then, you know, we have reptiles there that, that come, you know, they're part of the student population. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> up in the corner, uh, you can see our walking path, which believe it or not, was it's been such a big hit this year. Something simple like just putting lines on campus for kids to walk around has been uh, a, a big support for our students. So with that, I, uh, that concludes my report this evening. So I'd like to take any questions or comments and thank you for uh, listening tonight.
That was bad tough fun presentation. I love how you guys team school pride. Uh, so thank you guys for sharing that. Congrats to um, a new Emily and then also Malia as well too. Um, I am curious. I mean, this idea of like chocolate milk for a Kenyan. I mean, that is like really fun, right? Like just love chocolate milk. Have you guys? If I think about gamification, like the idea like of the class dancing together. I know there are inter class competitions. Have you ever considered just saying, if you raise your average attendance by 2% for your one class, you guys as a class can get chocolate milk all together? Because sometimes, if you're competing, you're like, oh, there's no way I'm going to do it. But if we all just say, we got to get 2% higher, have you ever thought of something like that? No, I haven't. I have, but that's the goal for next year. That's yeah. what they'll say. This really came up organically, because we're begging for chocolate milk. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Um, I thought it wasn't allowed anymore. Our cafeteria manager said it is. So we just kind of put together the grade level with the best attendance and a whole month gets chocolate milk. Yeah. Um, but but no, I, maybe attendance improvement would be another one. Maybe I'll do yeah. strawberry milk or something. Yeah, or like just like a chocolate milk. Just like one pack of you guys. Just one pack of you guys. Yeah, yeah no, if, you, if there's some mathematical way to do that, that's easy. I, I, you know, I'd like to know about that. Yeah, I mean, we really do it by grade level because we do have 125 to 130 students per one period. Like to do it by class would be difficult, but um, that might be, yeah, that would be something that we go through school. And um, I get to come back to lunch one day if you ever invite one of them. You ever come back to lunch? I would like to come to lunch one day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, we have pizza <laughs> lunch and mini. I think mean, you want to come to Prime Rib. Not Prime Rib. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was that. Prime Rib. I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry.
governing board. Um, I have two, two items to share with you. One, you, know, you do a lot of work through the course of the year and sometimes you, you don't see the outcomes of it, but uh, a few months back you all approved for the Baca High um, Naming Facility Committee, the Joan Luma uh, softball field. And the Thursday before break, there was a, a ceremony at a softball game between Baca High and Wilsey Wood. Uh, honoring Mrs. Mumma, you can see the plaque that is going up on the, on the fence at the stadium there. Um, just a, a great event. Um, Joan was, was honored. The, uh, the crowd, I think on this picture, you can see in the background on the far right, the crowd was just enormous. In fact, I offered to coach the alumni team because there were some storied names that showed up that day. And uh, I think we could have we could have won some games. They they were they were amazing. The thing that was best about all of it, so both the Wilsey Wood team and the Back of High team brought flowers for Mrs. Muma, which was was super awesome. You can see her getting hugs from both teams, and it really felt like the players on those teams understood what Mrs. Muma has done for for girls athletics in, in the city of Vacaville over the years. So it was just a neat day, and wanted you to to know that your work on this one was certainly very much appreciated. Um, so tonight, you see all these faces out here. Come on up, Mrs. Burks. Um, see these faces out here that are gonna talk to you about literacy. And so we figured, what a good time to give an update on some things that are related to reading and literacy. So Kelly's going to do that. Do you want to see her walk?
So the earnings tokens for those programs, and I'm going to use them to purchase the books that I'll be sending to you. Um, so that's really neat. So those are going to be installed um, hopefully over the summer. We're going to be bringing that contract forward for you for you uh, to review and approve um, to purchase these vending machines and um, get those installed. And most of them uh, will go in the libraries at the sites. There's a couple others that will be in different locations. Um, the maintenance department went over and determined the best location for all of these. Um, and it's really neat. So this will be able to happen through this very generous donation. Uh, and then the other thing that they're going to do is some teacher uh, grants, where teachers can apply for these grants, um, and then they can use them to either supplement their um, English and language arts programs. Um, and another example is that uh, we have a lot of new teachers that come into the district, and especially at the elementary level, where they want to create those classroom um, book nooks, you know, in their classes where they have uh, books that the students can check out. And so we'll have grant applications where they can do that as well. Uh, so the committee will develop those applications. They're in the process of doing that now. We'll come up with a scoring rubric and, and ways that we can um, honor Mary Jo through this, um, through these grants, and support our teachers as well, and students, and maybe. So we're really excited about it. So more information to come, and you'll hear more about the reading program you're going into. So we just want to say thank you to Conrad for reaching out and letting us know. Uh, we had no idea <laughs> that this was the case. Um, and of course, to Mary Jo, uh, we want to honor her and respect her and, and continue her love of reading in our district. So thank you. And that concludes my report. <coughs> we only did half of it. Right? No, okay, you're good. smart. That's, That's good. good. All right. Board member comments. I think at our last board meeting, I had volunteered one day at the Callison uh, Scholastic Book Fair, and I was thrilled to do three additional days and really uh, have the full Scholastic uh, Fair experience. <laughs> it was fantastic. I met so many parents and community volunteers that were also there. And um, I also realized that last time I gave a shout out to the library technician but um, I just called her Karen because that's how I knew her. And then, you know, I was like, oh, I really need to use her full name. So the shout out is uh, to Miss Nicolette, uh, Nicoletti, who um, I heard most have heard her name a million times during those four days because every student knew her and knew, interacted with her. And also, you know, not only was it um, wonderful to see all the volunteers and all of the students come in, by classroom and also individually before school um, to you know look at books and purchase books, uh, but it was also I just want to you know it is so much work to pull off a scholastic book fair, you know the, the unpacking of the materials, reordering during the middle of the fair, um, packing it all up at the end. So um, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience, um, and I just kind of feel like you know we're all talking about literacy today and those vending machines so that was a wonderful experience um, and thank you for the really warm welcome that I received there by all of the, the teachers and the um, classified staff and the excited administration um, last time I also mentioned um, that you know if you are the parent or guardian or know a parent or guardian of a, a pre-k a tk or a kindergartner you know we have wonderful uh, opportunities in our district and there is an early education enrollment extravaganza Carnival, um, April 13th from 9 to noon at the uh, Shelley Dally Early Learning Village. So if you aren't familiar with the programs that we have in early literacy, uh, this is a great opportunity to check them out and hopefully uh, get your child started on that path of literacy because we know the greatest success, uh, indicator of success for a student is the ability to read a grade level by second or third grade. So it's never too early to get your child started in our wonderful um, programs. And lastly, I just wanted to mention an event that I'm going to attend. Um, it is, um, it's called BU 2024, and it's an event for special needs awareness. And it's gonna be at the Play for All Park, uh, which for those of you who don't know, is a wonderful playground for students, uh, for children, with um, all different levels of ability. 
and um, it's near the corner of Elmira Road and Leisure Town. It's um, sort of in my neck of the woods, and so I'm very familiar with it, and I want you to become familiar with it as well. And there's a wonderful event on April 28th from 1 till 4. It's a free event, and I'm going to be there, and I would love to see as many people as possible come out and learn more about um, this really special place in our community and um, have a fun day and learn more about um, all of the, the children in our district and all of the, um, the wonderful abilities they have. And this is a place that focuses on abilities, not on disabilities. So I hope to see you all there. And that's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Kitsis, for the wonderful letter. <laughs> There's nothing there. Okay. Chocolate milk with it? I wish. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, school board members, Superintendent Seta Padre, and President Jansen. I'm Jason Carlos Ruiz, here to offer you an up to date update on our happenings at Wood C. Wood. Tomorrow at 6 30 p.m. will be the Honors Concert featuring the Wind Ensemble Chamber Orchestra and Sylvan Singers as a true reflection as to how impressive the musicians of wood have become over our four years of learning. Also, Practice for Clue, our spring comedy, is well underway. Get ready for it on May 9th to the 11th. And Marching Band has started to be ready for this fiesta day for us to score first place as we rightfully so this year. Trust me, I promise you as drum major. Auditions for the talent show have been submitted with the talent show happening in April 26. Next Friday, the Future Wildcat Festival will be happening with all the kiddos from the elementary schools coming. It's a very bare period as we transition into the final inning stretch, but just know that we at Wood are doing totally fine and being our peaceful, loving selves. Thank you for your time. spoke to you, more was happening, and it was super fun, dance, and it was very successful. Our student council was able to adapt to the sudden rainy weather change. We had recently planned an outdoor rally that's that's held prior to the night dance. We had to cancel it because it would have been raining on everyone, and that would not have been fun at all. But instead, we had a super fun face painting and music in the quad, and it was covered by the rain, so we also got to hang out with each other before we headed back to the dance. So that was very fun. And then this week, following spring break, was the first week of CAS testing for our juniors, meaning that every Monday and Tuesday we have a block schedule. Meaning like on Mondays we spend two hours in every class and then same with Tuesday. And then in order to maintain attendance levels during the block schedule, if you don't have any absences during the block schedule period, then at the end of the CAS testing, you'll be able to leave class 15 minutes early, which is a fantastic incentive to avoid after school traffic. Um, and then in a few short weeks, our annual men's competition, Mr. DQ, will be held on Saturday, May 4th, with a handful of senior boys competing for free prom tickets, because they are starting at $100. And then the theme is Kendom, in reference to the recent Barbie movie. <laughs> They're all be dressing up as different Ken Barbie dolls. And so we are looking forward to it, and more information will come out once it gets closer. So thank you for listening. Spring is going to be a busy time at EKCA, or Ernest Kenny Charter Academy. We are still enrolling students that are looking for a different approach to school. Our last Kimmy Academy orientation for the year was this week, and we welcomed 16 new Kimmy Kings to our school. 
Ralph is continuing to do orientations through the middle of May. Orientations for the 2024 and 2025 school year will start in late May and run through June. The first day back was all about the eclipse. Kimmy Ralph Earth Science classes got to learn about the eclipse and how to safely view it. They used various strategies to create eclipse viewers that let them watch it safely. State cast testing will start at Ralph next week with Kimmy Academy to follow. Staff is busy getting prepared with to help our students do their best during the assessment weeks. Our March Madness attendance challenge is in its final week. I know it's April, but we started halfway through March. Um, students who performed their attendance by who improved their attendance by 10% will earn a special luncheon with some additional privileges included. We can't wait to see how our students did. The Marine Corps came and gave a presentation to Kimmy's students who are interested to learning more about the armed services, specifically the Marines. 25 students attended and got to hear from three different representatives what their experiences have been. Students asked really good questions and asked them to come back. excitement around campus as our seniors have been receiving college acceptance letters throughout the past few weeks. We are proud to mention that some of our seniors have been offered admission to UCLA, UC Berkeley, Caltech, John Hopkins, and many other prestigious colleges. Congratulations to our Buckingham Knights for being the Spring 2024 Division III Vocabulary Bowl champion. They mastered a total of 50,417 words. Our juniors have finished their CAS testing this week, taking their last science portion, and we congratulate them on their hard work. Our robotics team also went to their East Bay Regional Competition at Berkeley High and placed 11 out of 60. Buckingham Theater is also currently ongoing ticket sales for the production of Mamma Mia. Shows are held from April 25th to 27th, and tickets can be bought at downtowntheater.com. Our softball team also won against Faith Christian on Tuesday, and our track and field team will be having a meet this Friday in Musician Love and Roadway events. ASB is also currently ongoing steps to re-elect executives of the student leadership and they wish our candidates luck as they apply for a leadership position in our student body. We are also preparing for our incoming candidates for interviews and we wish them good luck as well. It's also the time of year for a lot of field trips at Buckingham. <coughs> Engineering students had a great time at the Sacramento Aerospace Museum before break and we also have a group of students attending the Career Day and A's game at the Oakland Coliseum next week. Thank you for listening. to show how we plan to meet our LCAP goal 1.2, which is improving student achievement in reading. You may have heard the statement that from kindergarten to third grade, students learn to read, and then in fourth grade and beyond, they need to learn. We often find that students are able to read in third grade, but some struggle in the later grade levels as the text becomes more complex. Why is that? We know reading is an essential skill. For many students, it does not come naturally. It must be explicitly taught. 
fact, only 32% of fourth grade students are reading proficiently according to the NAEP, National Assessment of Educational Progress. And as you know, if students are not reading proficiently, proficiently by the third grade, they're at a higher risk of dropping out of school. This graph from the NAEP shows nationwide data on fourth grade reading proficiency over the last three decades. As you can see, not much progress has been made in the last 30 years, despite changes in initiatives, political leaders, and the global pandemic. Why hasn't it changed? Reading well requires both foundational skills to recognize and decode words and a strong knowledge base to support comprehension and enable deeper learning. For the past 30 years, the dominant reading instruction philosophies, whole language and balanced literacy have de-emphasized foundational skills that have not supported consistent knowledge building and comprehension. Some may see this as a pendulum swing because we're going back to explicit and systematic phonics instruction. But now, we know better. Um, in the past five decades, much more comprehensive research has been done worldwide in multiple languages that defines the importance of language comprehension and word recognition in learning to read. And recent research on how the brain acquires the skill of reading has evolved. Uh, we now have a deeper understanding of how the brain processes multiple sources of information while reading. Brain researchers have used functional magnetic resonance Im imagery or fMRI imaging to identify areas and networks of the brain involved in processing print, speech sounds, language, and meaning. And since we're not born with the neural connections required for reading, we now know that efficient pathways must be built with explicit systematic instruction and deliberate practice. So the science of reading is a vast interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research about reading and issues related to reading and writing. And it's derived from research in these following areas. Science of reading is important because it informs educators how proficient reading and writing develop within students, why some students struggle to learn to read, and how we can effectively assess and build their skills. This allows us to improve our teaching practices so that we can prevent reading difficulty and know how to intervene when necessary. Take a look at the screen over there. Scarborough's reading rope <clears throat> is a visual metaphor created by Dr. Hollis Scarborough. It illustrates the complex components of reading development. It intertwines word recognition skills, which you can see on the bottom, bottom left-hand corner over there, such as phonics and sight word recognition, with language comprehension skills, which you see at the top left over there, such as vocabulary, background knowledge, and comprehension strategies. The rope emphasizes how these skills gradually intertwine and strengthen over time, leading to skilled reading. It's important to note that a rope is only as strong as its weakest thread. A deficiency in any strand impairs a student's progress towards skilled reading. In the last decade, 47 states and the District of Columbia have passed laws or policies to encourage the science of reading aligned practices. This includes teacher preparation and credentialing, improved instructional practices, targeted alignment, and accountability and commitment to student achievement. For example, in July 2023, California Senate Bill 114 was signed, was signed into law mandating a dyslexia screener for all kindergarten to second grade students beginning in school year 2025-2026. In February 2024, Assembly Bill 2222 was introduced to the California leg legislature. It intends to align California teacher accreditation, professional development, and instructional materials to the science of reading. Anticipating that California universities will implement changes to ensure teacher candidates receive comprehension, 
um, instruction and science degrees, ERCC educational services along with RCI coordinators are supporting our current elementary um, staff in shifting towards the best practices in early years of physical instruction. Over the last three years, our teachers, administrators, and coordinators have had professional development around the science of reading. We've adopted and implemented a new core ELA curriculum in K2 that aligns with the science of reading, along with an updated supplementary curriculum focused on reading intervention. We have conducted a book study on literacy shifts and piloted a new literacy skills assessment system. Our elementary professional development days over the past two years have offered quarterly opportunities to learn more about the new literacy shifts and instructional practices. At each school, RTI coordinators support the literacy shifts, compile and analyze data to inform student study teams, provide targeted literacy instruction for struggling students, coach teachers in instructional practices, train and support paraeducators, provide professional development for their staff, facilitate the inventory and delivery of instructional materials for teachers, and we communicate regularly with our administrators. Over the course of the current school year, Ed Services staff and RTI coordinators collaborated to implement a pilot of the M-Class assessment system. M-Class is a digital version of DIBBLES for dynamic indicators of basic early literacy skills a research-based, science of reading aligned set of measures consistent with Common Core State Standards in Foundational Reading. Please examine this first grade mid-year data from one of our pilot classes. All the way to the left, we have the student's Diagnostic Reading Assessment, or DRA scores. This is the reading assessment that we previously used. These three students all had an overall score of 80. Typically, students would be grouped by the DRA level to form 80 groups. Then they were given text that matched their level. From the middle of the screen to the right, we have the in-class data, which offers a detailed breakdown by skill, clearly indicating whether each student meets the expected grade level proficiency in each specific skill area. This granular insight into individual skills proves more beneficial than a mere numerical score, as it guides instructional strategies and informs parents about specific areas that children can improve on. For example, these three students would be in the same reading group for their DRA score. However, the in-class data shows that they have different skill needs. In this group, student A would struggle the most in phonemic awareness, letter sounds, and composing, which are areas of strength for student B. Student C largely excels, but needs some additional support in phonemic awareness and reading accuracy. Student A is at grade level in word reading and reading fluency, despite being well below in decoding, which is sounding out printed words such as k, at. This tells us that this student is memorizing words, which works for simple words, but this child will struggle once they begin to encounter multisyllabic words because that student doesn't have the strategies needed to tackle decoding. This explicit data allows educators to target instruction to fill those skill gaps. So the pyramid in the upper right corner of this slide is a model for a response to intervention, or RTI. The red face represents tier one, regular classroom instruction for all students. The yellow layer represents tier two, targeted longer instruction in the classroom. And the green layer represents intensive instruction for struggling students administered by intervention staff. To support RTI at all levels, the M-Class provides actionable data, as you saw on the previous slide, geared to these students by skill need. M-Class also provides optional pre-made lessons for classroom teachers to use in their tier two longer intervention. And for intensive tier three intervention provided by the intervention Staff. Teachers may also give progress monitoring assessments as needed to evaluate student growth and implement lessons from M class. This enables natural literacy educators to help fill skill gaps for our older students and to intervene early in our younger students.
thereby reducing the number of children referred to student studies to understand the special education. Additionally, MCAS includes a dyslexia screener, which we will need to be compliant for the 2025 and 26 school year. Finally, MCAS includes clear and comprehensible reports for parents, which includes activities they can do with their child at home. So what's next for Vacaville Unified School District? With the implementation of MCAS, we will now have an assessment that's aligned kindergarten through sixth grade and includes Lectura, which are Spanish assessments for our dual immersion students in the SPICE program. Previously, we lacked skill-based data upon which to focus targeted interventions for struggling readers. While teachers are working with small groups, the remaining students can use the Amplify's Boost program with individualized digital <coughs> learning paths for our kindergarten through fifth grade students. SPICE students will have access to Spanish Boost Lectura in kindergarten through second grade. Since Boost is not currently available for sixth grade or in Spanish in the upper grades, these students will use a comparable product called IXL for differentiated practice. Not only does MCLAS provide actionable data, but it also will be the cornerstone of professional learning communities, or PLCs. Our teachers will be able to collaborate around the data and make instructional decisions about their students. And last but not least, we will continue our professional development around best practices in literacy instruction. So in conclusion, our journey towards improving literacy through the science of reading represents a transformative shift in our approach, one that is data-driven and student-centered. By embracing these evidence-based strategies and tools, we are not only preparing our students for academic success, but also setting a strong, strong foundation for lifelong learning and achievement. If you're interested in learning more about the shifts in literacy education, here's a list of some good resources.
And then with the different lessons, it gives you a menu of options. So you can start and say, oh, I'm going to start with all of the vowels. Then I'm going to move into some of the consonants. Then I'm going to have them read short stories. Uh, then I'm going to isolate those um, blends um, and, and work on some of those skills. So I do think that it's very accessible. Uh, the data really gives you, um, it's very clear. So yes, the program is telling you what to look for, but then as a teacher, you have a lot of choice in what you want to give the student. And then for parents, it gives you on the, as, on the back of this data sheet some different activities that work towards those skills. And they're very simple activities we do in the home. One is, you know, it's called a walk the room, where they say put up different words in your home or different letters in your home and make them say those letter names and sounds. Find different words. It's ways we tell students to have to type frequency words as well. Um, so there are things we're familiar with, but it makes it a lot more explicit. Does that answer all of your questions? It does. Um, <laughs> other than like the time component, and yeah. I didn't ask it, but it was yeah. kind of implicit in there, like for the teachers who are in this role mm -hmm. kind of analyzing this data, getting in, you know, familiar with mm -hmm. the information and the processes, is this something that um, is likely to extend the workday at least for a period of time, or is there some pretty intensive training that goes on ahead of time? Like, how does it look for a teacher that's mm -hmm. implementing in the class that isn't maybe, you know, kind of focused on that as a, mm -hmm. as a pilot who's just going to be, you know, given this program and said, go. I love that question. So um, I'm going to let others address the actual yeah. training that will be given to teachers. But um, coming in as a teacher and just grabbing lessons for the first time, I said, I want to just look at it as if saying, how much time would I plan for my reading groups? What time will I give that? That's the time I'm going to put into it. I went into the system and said, here are your students in this group. Here's some lesson to choose from. Print the lesson. I reviewed it. It's, it's post-structured plans uh, back to my uh, student teaching days, really, when you're back at the teaching credential program. Uh, so really, the preparation time was almost minimal. I probably spent less time than I did preparing for an entire guided reading lesson for all of my groups. Um, yeah, so the time limit, I do think it'll be different. You know, change is always hard, but I do think it will teachers will find they will have more time to spend on all of their students um, once they start making that shift. And I have introduced this to other teachers who are pilot classes and said, hey, you probably didn't know these lessons existed. Here they are. And they use some of them and they've said the same thing. Oh, this is really easy to use. And this, like, this was fun. This really addressed the skill. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And as far as the training part, we're offering, it, it's a three hour training that will be offered three different times. One um, at the end of the school year in June, once the school's out, or if somebody wants to do it in July or excuse me, in August, right before school starts. And then there's even one within the, the workday if they choose to do that when we return. Um, the trainings are uh, from there, once they've had that, we also have a lot of support with that with our team. And uh, with like for example, with kindergarten, we know that it's gonna be it would be difficult for them to assess their their students. So actually the RTI coordinators are doing all the kindergartners for the year. And then, but we'll work with them with the data so that they know how to, to read it, to, to deduce it, and then out. And teachers will have time to not, I mean, they they can use the lessons that are suggested, or some of them, you know, a lot of teachers have these skills and are like, oh, I know something that's similar, I can use this. So it does give them more time to, to read all the lessons. Christine. Oh, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, this is so fascinating to me about how reading for me is so instinctual and the research that is being done that you guys are also following around the science and particularly how do you help someone that's struggling in reading, that's really fascinating. Um, so the, I just want to acknowledge there's two, four, six, eight, ten of you and you all participated in that presentation, the amount of coordination to do this, <laughs> I just want to say hats off. Um, you know, when I talk in the community, there are so many of your colleagues that are coming up to advocate for our <coughs> FBI coordinators and share how essential and important you guys are in the work. So you can thank you for all that you do. Um, I am really curious about this MCAT thing. I think it's fascinating to have that deep dive into the data as you guys were talking about. How far out is this part? Like, how, what, how many classes are participating in it? How many students are, are getting this type of? So currently, it's one kindergarten, first grade, and second grade class at each school. Okay. And so the RTI coordinators are the ones that are doing the test piece right now, and also Krista and Stephanie and Cheryl are one of our digital specialists, uh, she also helped with it. So we really wanted them to dive into it first to see what does it look like, is this something we want to do, versus 
let's do it and then have a teacher and we wanted it to be you know tried out first and once we got through it and then we saw it and, I mean the one part that was pretty amazing to us was when we were looking at um, what we were currently using right there which was DRA and how teachers you know like I said when they get a, a number like that a lot of times they put them in their level groups based on on that and kids would you know why are some kids struggling more than others and it was because of that and um, we have a set of twins that are at a kindergarten, I gotta tell that story. There's a set of twins and in kindergarten at one of our schools that was in the pilot class and they could read everything just like amazing. Um, but when they got to the, the nonsense words, which are words they don't recognize, they could not decode. And so they, they, they just couldn't do it. And when um, Krista presented it to the teacher, the teacher said, why are you putting, suggesting this group for these students to, for decoding? They, they can read everything, and she's like, you're right, but they're memorizing. Because they are memorizing words, and they are really good at that. But when it became time to sound out words, they could not. Will we um, have an opportunity to look at data for the students that are in this pilot compared to the students that are not in this pilot for their class, in other classes, to see what the, the like, like the scoring is between the two classes? Unfortunately, the, the, this, the being kindergarten, first and second, they don't do CAPS. They don't start until third grade. Um, yeah, that, I, I would love to know what the uh, the other testing data how that um, compares um, across the years and cohorts that are participating versus not. But this is super fascinating. So in, in using that same metaphor, so this sounds fantastic, it sounds really interesting, but it seems like if teachers are feeling overwhelmed and too much to do, are they going to be able to really apply this, you know, the way that you want them to? So I don't even know that you have to answer that, but that's a question for me. It seems like that's part of like having to fix two things in order for it to be, you know, really work well. And I know really <laughs> She's, I mean, with her being the teacher, um, we are giving recommendations. Like when kids, when teachers are testing their students, um, we're recommending like a 30 minute testing time. It's not all day, you know, it's 30 minutes at a time, and there is a testing window of three weeks. So, but what would you want to Sure. Um, I guess I'll just add that all the testing that we've done in the past, this is much faster. It's so much better. DRA can take forever and as you've seen, and I've always thought this too, they don't give you a full picture about a child reads. So I think we've been given, doing our students a disservice. And I'm really excited about this change. Um, what's nice about M class is every single assessment is one minute long, every single one. So you can do, and it's really your classroom, your process. You could do one student and do a couple of assessments based on how much stamina that child has for the kindergartner, and it could be one. <laughs> First grader, sometimes we get two to three. Uh, or you can decide to do one assessment for your whole class, and you can do your whole class in 30 minutes, and then you're finished, and move on to some, and then the next day, do the next assessment. So I believe the maximum of a testing time is maybe six assessments, um, and that's in first grade. Most have up around four to five. So really, it, it is a much shorter time that we're testing, and we've been pulling them out of the classroom for some time. I thought the DRA could take like up to 40 minutes. <coughs> I think this is much better, and um, we'll be taking. Um, yes, testing is getting put on the teacher's plate, but you'll hear from teachers say, "Oh, I wish I could do my own testing because I need to hear them and I need to see what they're missing." Well, now they can, and it'll take less time.
And so I appreciate that there's less time to administer the test. I think one of the questions would be, that's only the start of the time, time grab, because once you do the testing, then you've got the data that you need to look at. And one would assume that as you provide some um, small group instruction, you back and retest. So it seems to me that there is some time involved with the uh, going through the data, even with the pre-made um, uh, options of some of the intervention lessons. So any thoughts about the amount of time it takes on an ongoing basis for a teacher to you know, go through the reports and sort of identify them, group, regroup their students, you know, plan those lessons, because I think <clears throat> while it's great that the class time is lessened because the less testing, the more instruction, yay, um, I'm all, I am a little concerned about the amount of time the data might be taking out of the teacher's day, which would, which would impact the prep time that Michael was talking about. So as soon as a student takes the test, it automatically goes into the database, and it automatically, that's what Salva did, we got it to send immediately into groups. So the teachers aren't putting it into a group. It gives them suggested groups, and it gives them the lessons. So in retrospect with DRA, where you had, you got, you know, somebody else did the assessment, and then they gave you everything um, to you so that you could go through it. That actually leads to the next step from there. You have to build the groups. So MPOC does it for you instantaneously. So I think that's kind of cool. Krista up here, I know Krista <laughs> was gonna, she talked to you a little bit about that. Yeah, so if you look back at this slide, you see how the color coding there, the, the pink or the red, is well below. So it's automatically going to put kids, those, those kids who are struggling the most are automatically going to be flagged and placed into a group, and then they can do those lesson plans. So what it's going to mean for a teacher is they used to get this information from an outside assessor, they looked at it, they formed their group, put all those kids who got a level eight in one group, gave them a level reader, and they all read it together. But that teacher didn't necessarily know why you got an eight and why you got an eight and why you got an eight. So it's gonna tell us exactly where the, those kids are lacking skills, and it will group the kids that way. So potentially it's gonna be way more efficient to fill the skill gaps and take the guesswork right out of it. Didn't exactly address my question, but I'll leave it for there. Oh, maybe move on. No better thing for our elementary teachers to be doing than looking at this data collectively in that extended PLC time on Friday. So that is going to be an additional add that they will have next year, um, and I think this that would be a great use of their time. And if they want to, you know, collaborate on, hey, I use this lesson and I'm really seeing to move my kids along that are struggling with this skill. If they want to share kids, all of those conversations would be perfect um, for PLC, and that time will be increasing significantly for our elementary teachers next.
that you can just infer and figure out what the source of the problem is. And it held them back a little bit because they kept putting them at a lower level because they couldn't be cooked. So is, is that something that might happen with this? Or? So eat like when, when a student takes the test at the level of grade level there, it, it, they take their, they have set ones that they give to each grade level. Mm -hmm. um, but if they are not successful in year one, it could open up more assessments. So they could dig deeper so if they do that. So then it would really pinpoint to what is exactly the root of the problem. And the other thing too to note is that this is always, when we did um, assessments, it was always Q2, which is uh, now we're gonna be able to address it 3-6, which the upper eight teachers, at least the ones that we've seen in our IMAP teams, think that are pretty excited about that because they have seen you know students that start to struggle and can't understand because they were at reading you know, at grade level or third grade but now they're going down. And so this is one of those things where it will help pinpoint that as well and allow the teachers in the upper grades to actually provide that tier two instruction and intervention in their classroom. Was there something to add? I, I did. Uh, one of the new things that we have for the upper grades, it, it starts with a grade level passage. So every kid gets the opportunity to show what they can do. And then it has the opportunity of unlocks things to dive deeper and to continue more. So it would be the reverse of what your kids experienced where they hit a ceiling and stopped. They would they would start at the top and as they if everything went fine, a kid who's reading fifth grade text, we assume that they also have uh, letter sounds and encoding. So we don't have to go back and check that because they've shown that they're successful in that. But if things are not going fine, then it opens up more and more assessments. So instead of stopping kids, it digs deeper to find what's the root of the problem. Does that make sense? It's like a flip. Okay. Anybody else? All right, fantastic. I got a couple. Um, <laughs> these questions. If they ask it, I don't re ask it. So that's it. <laughs> okay. If it's done, it's done. We'll, we'll move on from there. Um, I'm a, uh, I need a little help. Is the M, the M class is the assessment tool. Is it also the curriculum to address it? Okay, so the M class is assessment. Gives us stuff for parents to work on at home, very specific type things, which I think is exciting versus here, look at this other kid. You're going, what? I, I like the specific ideas, try these type of things, because if we're not working together, the kid's not going to learn very well. Um, then what's our curriculum? Are we changing our curriculum as well, or we're sticking with the, the curriculum we used in the past? We just adopted a new K through three ELA this year. This year, okay. So this is the first year of that going into place, and at the same time, we're piloting the M class assessment. We've been piloting it all year. We are planning to adopt it, bring it into place starting in August. Fantastic. That was another one of my questions is when are we going to go live from there? Okay, good. Because I saw some other things like my view and integrity, and I was getting a little confused on which one was which, so that's easily done. We only stuck on the
Porter with Next Steps Academy, LLC, uh, in the amount not to exceed $114,000, and this is for our expanded learning opportunity funds. Um, okay. Motion. Motion. Second. Motion and seconded. Student board member votes. All in favor? Yes. yes. Fantastic. So you head now. See you later. Go before the next vote. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh.